Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Bishop Brian Willett coming to you live from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains on this November 9th, 2018 for Vestiges After Dark. Brand new episode tonight, and we're talking about the rumors circulating around the Ghost Adventures live event. I was a participant in this event. I was able to see firsthand the things that were going on. And I am in a unique position to dispel some of these rumors, which I feel obligated to do, not just for my own reputation, but also for the reputation of everybody who participated in this show, all people who I greatly respect. We'll be talking about this tonight. We'll be talking about the Dybbuk box. Stay tuned. Don't go away. Thank you all for joining us tonight on this edition of Vestiges After Dark. I hope your evening is going very well. It's really quiet, unusually quiet in the chat room. I'm wondering if there's problems logging into it um, because typically it's usually very full by now. And I'm not really seeing anyone in there. Um, But if you are able to log into Spreaker, um, come and follow this show and go ahead and join us in the chat room. I'll be taking your questions, if there are any, later in the show to more or less talk about the topic tonight, which is uh, really everything that went on with uh, uh, Ghost Adventures Live in terms of the controversy surrounding it. Some of you really, really love the show. 
and some of you were not terribly impressed with it, and almost all of you seem to agree that it went downhill after um, the rabbi situation that occurred. So I want to come on and, and really sort of clarify my own personal experience with Ghost Adventures and Ghost Adventures Live, as well as more or less discuss you know some of the real things that went on because that's not always terribly clear. Now everyone's coming into the chat room. Welcome everybody. Um, welcome um, to the show and feel free to ask questions. I know uh, uh, Joy Keeling is uh, monitoring every one of your questions and will um, bring them to the uh, broadcast as soon as we are ready for them. And speaking of which, how are you doing tonight, Joy? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Great. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, this is kind of an interesting topic. You you watched Ghost Adventures Live, right? Yes, absolutely. What were your totally feelings watched. on the show? <laughs> it was There was so much chaos. <laughs> it, it was really just... As soon as they got started, it just, you know, it started off a little slow. Then all of a sudden, bam, 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 bam. And it was hard to keep up. It was exhausting. So at the end of four hours, I was just laying there going, ah, oh, so tired. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's one of the most important things. Maybe we should start yeah. off with that one. I know that on social media, and I follow it pretty closely. Uh, believe it or not, I'm really not on social media as much as you all think I am. I am very fast to answer questions on Twitter. I do have Twitter. Um, on my smartphone. And so, you know, anytime I get a second or two, I will, you know, log in real quick, see if there's any questions. And I will do my best to answer any questions that come up as quickly as possible. I, it's something I like doing. And I use social media as a teaching tool, as a medium for being able to disseminate quality information about the subjects that I, you know, work within. And and so, you know, I do, I, I do, try to answer all of them. I don't always catch all of them. And sometimes I can't answer all of them because of time and because I actually do work. <laughs> so, um, you know, but I'm, I am, I am out there. And one of the things that I did notice, uh, some of the questions coming in, people were wondering about the level of the investigation itself. Um, they weren't understanding why, um, EMF readings weren't being taken, um, they weren't understanding, you know, why certain things that they that the Ghost Adventures crew do on almost every investigation were not being done on the the live broadcast. And I will say right off the bat, I was not privy to the investigation methodology. All right, I wasn't part of the investigation. In fact, maybe I should even preface all of this by saying that I was asked out there by Zach Bagans to help protect the, the the everybody involved. I was not asked to be out there to seal the Dybbuk box. I was not asked to be out there to be present in the room when the Dybbuk box was opened, assuming it was going to be opened. I was only asked to be there as a support system in case somebody in the course of the evening through some of the things that they were planning to do um, if they developed an attachment to be able to be on call and ready to go to resolve that particular issue, whatever it might have been. So I think there was some confusion from the get go uh, because I know a lot of people did not were not happy that I wasn't utilized more. I mean, certainly I, you know, I, I saw a lot of comments regarding that um, and. I want to make it clear that from the very beginning, I was never going out there to be a part of this show for the Dybbuk box. It was really just, you know, to be on call for whatever need might have a, uh, come up that, you know, I would be called on by the Ghost Avengers crew and I'd come in and help whoever needed that help. And if, if Zach at some point wanted me to be in the Dybbuk box room, or if things got out of hand and they needed somebody to seal it, then I would be there to do so. Okay, so let's just set the record straight on that one because I know that a lot of you have asked me, why didn't Zach use me? Why, didn't, why did Det Zach call in this rabbi? Um, well, that's the reason because I was, never, I was never coming out for the Dybbuk box. I was coming out just to keep everybody safe and to you know provide blessings to those who wanted them going in 
and those who needed them coming out. Okay, which I did, and I did in abundance. Believe me, I, I was blessed out by the end of that trip. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that clears up some of the uh, questions and controversies regarding my role and why I was there and why I wasn't utilized in the way that the audience were was expecting. Um, again, I don't do this for television. I'm, I'm not an actor. And, uh, you know, I don't I'm not doing it for screen time. I'm not doing it for exposure. Um, I'm doing it to keep people safe. That's what I do. So I know some people were wondering, well, what did you think about being involved in something that had so many dark rituals? And, you know, you're you know, you you being a, a, a Catholic bishop, you know, was there some conflict of interest here? And no, because my role is to keep people safe. People are going to do what people are going to do. If I went out there or if I didn't go out there, they were still going to do everything that they did for the show. And some of what they did for the show is actually spiritually dangerous. And I would f much rather be there to protect them than to say, you know what? I'm not going to be a part of this. You, you know, you do this. It's on, it's on you. No, I would never do that. I, I consider, you know, the Ghost Adventures crew, to, I, I respect all all of them i respect i respect everybody that's involved in this show everyone i have met including all of the guests that i met and that was really the the for me that was the shining moment of coming out for ghost adventures live it was not about being on television again it wasn't about you know uh, being there to do work or see the divic box it was really all about meeting all these wonderful people from the paranormal community, leaders in the paranormal community, people that are truly um, brilliant minds and contributing in, 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 in tremendous ways to the, this, the research in this field and, and being a part of that and meeting all of them, networking with them. Because I had never really, I mean, we, we've interacted, some of us have interacted, uh, you know, remotely, but never really had an opportunity where we could all be together like this. It was a great opportunity and I enjoyed that. Um, so obviously I really wanted to keep all of them safe. And that was my only motivation for going out there. As you all know, I mean, those of you who listen to the show, I'm sure probably know, but I want to put it on the record for those who might never have heard a, uh, an episode of mine and maybe are just listening to this because of the subject matter tonight. I want to make it very clear from the very beginning, okay, so that you guys know we're, we're, we're setting the precedent that I'm real. I'm a real bishop. I'm not an actor. I'm not a charlatan, as I've been accused, uh, you know, since Ghost Adventures Live by several different people. Um, you know, I I really do this work and I do it very seriously. And um, this is all that I do. Um, I do not charge people for anything that I do. I, um, I do everything completely free of charge. Um, there are, of course, always um, you know, the appreciation for donations because the ministry would fall apart if people didn't support it. And a lot of the people who we do service in this ministry are not in a financial position to support it. So that has to come from benefactors or people who, you know, really respect and believe and, and feel a part of what we do and want to help it. You know, I mean, there's certain things I, I, I mean, I can I can charge donations for. Um, like teaching certain courses and things like that. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to the actual exorcism ministry, I can't charge for that. And I don't take a salary from the church. I make that very clear to everyone. I mean, maybe someday if the church has the resources, it would be nice to be able to be compensated for the extensive amount of time that I put into the ministry, um, which is, you know, in excess of 50, 60 hours a week, sometimes more. Um, but at the present time, the church can't afford it. So everything that the church collects stays in the church and is is uh, allocated to the expenses of the church. Um, so I don't c collect a salary. I haven't collected a salary in years. Um, so, th you know, that's another thing that I just want to demonstrate. Not that I'm trying to say, hey, look at how great I am. I'm just saying this so that you all know I am the real deal. OK, I don't come on television for personal notoriety fame I, I could give a good damn about fame i do it because i want people to be educated about this subject and i want people to feel uh, comfortable seeking help for it it's not a taboo 
Okay, people treat it as one. People think you're crazy when you talk about you might a de- demonic affliction. Um, I want to normalize it, and so that's why I'm so public. Uh, but you know, when Zach called me and said, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about you being a part of Ghost Adventures Live. <clears throat> I mean, I was honored that uh, he was even thinking about me for this. But you know, when he told me what he wanted of me. Uh, of course, how could I how could I turn him down when, you know, he's coming to me so that I can keep everyone safe and protected and I wouldn't turn him down. So that's why I did it. And 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 honestly, my relationship to the show um, is such that I would, you know, I, I, I've, I've thought about whether or not I would do more episodes uh, and Zach and I have talked about the potential of doing additional episodes in the future, um, and I'm I'm cool with that. Uh, I I absolutely want to help any chance that I get, any chance that he gives me to help a family, any chance that he gives me to be, you know, a part of this wonderful thing that that he does. You know, going into people's homes and helping them, uh, parts that you don't always get to see on the show. You know, which is a lot more extensive than you see on the show, because, I mean, the show's more about showing you the evidence and kind of giving you a really good, enjoyable story to watch for an hour. But, I mean, it's re- it's serious. Behind the scenes, there's so much more going on than you ever get to see. And, um, you know, when he calls me in to help a family, I mean, you, mu- you might, I mean, you've seen extensive examples of that on the previous episodes I've been on. But, you know, sometimes we just go in and 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 help you you don't get to see much of that okay so i just want that to be very clear that what i do is very real what ghost adventures does is very real so that takes us back to this um rabbi rabbi shea harlig and one the first rumor that i'm seeing out there right now is that he is a uh, not a real rabbi and some of the claims that they're using to prove this point is that he didn't know what a dybbuk box is so i want to first clarify these two points the first point being is um shea harlig a real rabbi yes he's a real rabbi and a simple google search would have proven this to you he's talked before the house of representatives for goodness sake he's given prayers you know, in the in the House of Representatives, uh, he's a real rabbi, folks. <laughs> um, you know, so just because he didn't know what a Dybbuk box is doesn't mean he's not real. And I can tell you why he didn't know what a Dybbuk box is, because guess what? Dybbuk boxes aren't a Jewish thing. <laughs> There's really only, the one only one. Dybbuk... There's only one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Oh, thank you for saying that, Joy, because it's so true. Yes. Uh, there, there's only one. Yeah, I've been paying attention to it since the beginning. It's it's they they called it the Divic box because that that was just what they called that particular one. It didn't have a name before that. Right, right. They invented so, that name. They did, and it wasn't the, it wasn't the rabbis who did. It's not part of Judaism. No. It's not like part of their faith. So, you know, I think people are thinking, oh, of course, every rabbi knows what a Dybbuk box is. I mean, there's like, the, like they talk like these, there are these Dybbuk boxes all over the place. No. Well, Zach's got the like only real one. They act like it's a genie in a bottle. <laughs> I know a genie. Well, I mean, technically it kind of is a genie in the bottle, but Zach's the only sort one of. with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, that's, that's a big misconception. And I want to clarify that, that um, there really is only one Dybbuk box. And the one that Zach has is the, is the actual one. And it would not be typical or at all for a rabbi to even know what it is. Okay, so uh, let's clarify that one right off the bat. Okay, Um, and so, you know, I will say, you know, Rabbi Shia Harlig. I mean, he was a. It was. I mean, my interactions with with him were were strange. I I talked a little bit about that on Twitter, and I want to be honest about it. Uh, You know. I respect the man. I don't know if he respects me, but I, I, I certainly respect him I, uh, as a religious authority. Um, and um, as, as a Catholic bishop, you know, we have a natural respect for our, uh, our foundation, which is Judaism. You know, I mean, the, 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 I know that Judaism doesn't necessarily see, necessarily see Christianity 
as a, a, the natural progression. But for Christians, you know, Judaism is its its foundation. So, um, you know, there's a natural respect, at least from our side. Uh, you know, I, you know, he was a little rude. I, I, I'm not going to say he wasn't. Um, he seemed very annoyed about being there. Um, he was not really very clear on what he was asked there to, to or or he was there to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I, he he did mention to me that he was asked to do like some prayers if they were needed. Um, but he really did not believe that the Dybbuk box was truly haunted. And he honestly thought at the beginning, and this gets to the whole big controversy of the script <coughs> comment, which hopefully Zach's YouTube video has clarified, although I've seen, and, and part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast on this subject is because I've seen even subsequently after his video, there are still people saying that he paid the rabbi off, the rabbi's not real, he's an actor. You know, I'm seeing all of this nonsense, and all of that is complete nonsense. Zach didn't pay him off. I'm sure that Zach would never do such a thing. And honestly, the guy is a real rabbi. He runs an actual temple, okay? So he's the real deal. Um, but he, it was not entirely clear to him what he was needed there for. He seemed to be doing a favor for somebody, a mutual friend uh, of either Zach or someone that's associated with the production. And, um, you know, the, there was at some point the indication that maybe they would have or should have a rabbi there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about sealing the Dybbuk box and whether or not a rabbi would have really been necessary because I know a lot of the questions that I've been getting have been related again back to why weren't you utilized? You, I mean, why wouldn't Zach use you? You're the you're his, you know, you know, you're you're his spiritual protection. He called you out there. It doesn't make sense that he wouldn't use you. I've heard all of these. So I want to really kind of, you know, clear all that up. Um, but, you know, the comment of, of, of when the rabbi said, you know, uh, it might not be according to the script you're using or something to that effect. And people ran with that thinking, see, this is the smoking gun. This proves Ghost Adventures is, is a fraud. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, he... It was a very poor choice of words on his part. Part of it was, again, his ignorance to the whole situation. So let me clarify a little bit of what happened behind the scenes. We were, Sister Mary Joan and I were in the courtyard the entire night. That was where they kept the people who were ready to come on to the next, um, uh, you know, they had so many segments uh, with commercial breaks between. And so the people that were getting ready for the next segment would come into that area. We, however, were there the whole night because we didn't know. No one knew whether or not we would need to be called on. If somebody developed a problem, we were going to get called in. And so we were always ready, always on call, ready to go. Um, and so we got to meet everybody and we saw everyone coming through. And so when it was time for to bring in the rabbi in, because Zach was getting ready to potentially open the Dybbuk box, the rabbi came to the courtyard and we got to meet him. Uh, he wasn't particularly friendly to us. Um, you know, Sister Mary Joan introduced herself and said hi. He kind of really basically um, brushed her off, um, didn't seem interested in carrying on a conversation. Um, but we were watching the show on a cell phone uh, and uh, kind of just seeing what was really going on. And, um, you know, we were all talking about the various things and something happened on the show and all of us who were there, uh, the other guests and whatnot, uh, were, were engaging in conversation about something that had happened. And, um, and the rabbi noticed that we were talking about it, but being very serious about it. And he, and he said to me, and I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you. He said to me, he says, wait a second. You guys think there's a ghost in that box? He said, just like that. Um, and we looked at him and said, well, we don't know what's in that box per se, but we think there is definitely something, you know, that is potentially spiritually dangerous associated with it. And, you know, that's why we're all here to kind of research and find out more about it. And he says, I was, I thought I was coming down here to be on a show. And we said, Yes, you are. <laughs> but he, he seemed to think that it, it was like a, 
a performance. He didn't seem to realize that this was reality, and we were all there in the capacity of it being actual reality television. So when he came on and wasn't sure what was going on, and he used the word script, I'm sure in his mind he thought all of this was some kind of show, not realizing that all of it was absolutely brutally real. He didn't really realize that. And I don't think even after conversing with him about it, and we were the ones that really informed him about what the Dybbuk box was, I don't think even after that, he really realized to the furthest extent that we were all actually very real people there to do our very real jobs for Zach's very real show. Okay? Um, And that's where the disconnect in communication came from. I I get the impression, although I don't know for sure, I get the impression it was a very last-minute decision. I don't know if it was on the part of the rabbi or on the part of the the show. Um, When he was talking about script, he might have seen some of the producers, you know, because live production is a much larger affair than it is when you're doing a, um, a, a, a recorded episode, which is what, you know, Ghost Adventures fans are used to seeing. Um, yeah. so there's a lot of people, I mean, you're talking when, when we shoot a ghost adventures, you know, Sin City, um, Ogden, um, exorcism and Aerie, there's like five or six people, you know, you got, you got Zach, you got Billy, you got Aaron and Jay, and then you got Mike, the sound guy, and you have, you know, like a, uh, a production manager that kind of helps with the equipment. That's about it. Sometimes you have um, uh, Dakota or, you know, some support camera uh, crew there, uh, but it's very small. But for live television, you're talking like hundreds of people now. And they did have, of course, a production map that would tell them where the commotion breaks were and how to organize the show so that everybody could that that was there would have. A, a chance to do what they were there to do. So there was sort of an organization there, but that what I mean, nobody's told what to say. Nobody's ever really told anything. In fact, I mean, I'm always kept in the dark. When Zach calls me to do an episode, I don't know squat about it. I, I, I will get a call either from him or from a producer. Um, the producer will then basically assist me with booking the travel and find out what works within my schedule for when I can come out and, you know, getting Sister Mary Joan set up because, you know, she works actually a secular job. I don't, but she does. And so that's another d- dynamic that has to be considered. And so that's all worked out. But if I ask, the, if I ask you know, the production manager or, you know, anybody, um, well, you know, tell me about this case or what's going on. Uh, they always tell me they, they can't say anything. That, you know, if if Zach wants me to know, he'll let me know. And, you know, more often than not, Zach does give me sort of the the basis of what I need to know. But he doesn't really tell me much. And part of that is so that what ends up happening happens organically. So that there isn't any, um, you know, uh, scripting or acting or or influencing the direction of the the show. What you get on Ghost Adventures is real. Now, you know... Of and course, then, you're talking and then about you get that genuine response too, and you need that. It's reality yeah. television. Um, you know, you get six or seven hours, maybe sometimes eight, nine, ten hours of footage that's all condensed down to forty-three minutes when you consider commercials. And um, you know, you're so you're getting the best of everything. So another question that came up about this whole thing is that you know, again, we were talking about. Why didn't Zach use EMF? Um, and I again was not privy to the production methodology uh, or the investigation method uh, or the investigation at all. I wasn't part of it. I was outside on call in case someone had a problem. But the the I I assume, and this is from my own experience in paranormal investigation because that's a part of what I do in terms of you know hunting demonic things and getting rid of them for people who are afflicted. Um. I can tell you that the amount of EMF that the equipment that they need to run a live production yeah. was probably so high that it would have been a moot point to try to use uh, an EMF detector because you probably wouldn't have been able to tell what was paranormal or what was equipment. There was so much everywhere. And this is part of the whole thing about 
you know, live television. It's not really conducive to uh, paranormal investigation. It's really not a good thing to do. Um, yeah. And it's not Cause it's, Zach's. It's so unpredictable. It is unpredictable. And it's not Zach's formula. That's not the way he likes to work. Zach puts his entire heart and soul into this work. You, you can love him. You can hate him. You know, but the fact is, that is Zach. All right. The real man it lives and breathes this work. And honestly, you know, he would never do anything that would diminish the integrity of his show. And that's why he brings on people like me and even Shea Harlig, um, you know, because, I mean, he, he wants reputable people there. He doesn't he doesn't want to fill it with a bunch of, you know, questionable, dubious people. Um, that would bring the entire production into question. Um, you know, so that's something that I I want everybody that has been critical of this to consider. Um, it's not conducive. So if you didn't see things on Ghost Adventures Live that you're used to seeing on the regular show, it's most likely because the show was just so different and it had to be because you're having to cut to Josh Gates doing his intros. You got to cut to commercial because I mean, you, everyone's complaining about the commercials. Well, you know, live television is an expensive affair and it's, the, yeah. it's, it's those, it's those sponsors that bring it to you. So you wouldn't have a show at all if it weren't for them. <laughs> and then you take into consideration the fact that, Sometimes the paranormal just doesn't perform on command. It so doesn't. you have to really ramp things up as high as you can yes. to make sure you're going to get that evidence. Oh, God, Bring in the top point. people in the field. You know, you know, these people get results. You know that these objects are cursed because you deal with them day in, day out. Yeah. So you know which ones to bring out. You know which ones are going to get the best results which person would work best with them? That's not. That's a different strategy than when you're going in and just investigating a location. You have to make sure that this is going to do something and it's going to be exciting and it's going to be willing to grab everybody's attention. Because yeah, that that's what that's why they wanted it to be live. And you know, it, it's not a good show for being live. No, you have to take your time and talk to these entities. You know, there's got to be a story behind it because it's not just about the evidence. It's about the stories of these people who have been haunted. It's these stories of these people who have died, who can't tell their stories anymore. And that's what Zach is doing. He's sharing these stories that other people wouldn't listen to. Or maybe they couldn't because it's a dead person. Right. He's, he's telling – it's a documentary. And people just say, oh, reality TV and write it off. But he's coming at it as a documentary to tell these people's stories. And in the process, he's also sharing a lot about himself and his crew as well. I mean, when he went to the, the clown motel, you yeah. know, I, 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 am not, I am not phobic of clowns, but I don't <laughs> think I would be in the room with that big ass clown with the hand <laughs> moving the hell no. And he came out of there in tears. I mean, yeah. you know, and that's part of what inspired me to come forward with my story. Because, you know, if he can do it, so can I. Right. Right. Yeah, I, so, yeah. You, you make a good point. And I really, I, I want to draw attention to something you sort of talked about there. Um, you know, some people complain that Zach's too dramatic. It's too ridiculous. You know, he overreacts, which, you know, makes it seem. And I want to say, you know. This is Zach's passion, okay? What you're seeing there is not Zach overreacting. What you're seeing there is not Zach, you know, trying to make a big dramatic display for television. This is Zach's passionate response. He's to just so excited. Yeah, <laughs> almost like a child, you know, who, 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 yeah. who you know, at Christmas morning. You know, he's kind of like that. When he gets evidence, it invokes that kind of response. There's a very childlike characteristic to to Zach Bagans, um, a, a sort of innocence to him that is really actually kind of refreshing, um, which I like about him. I mean, it's one of the things I actually like about him, which is something that he was more, you know, that he sort of expressed more because it, it, it's one of his, you know, best qualities. And that comes out in his investigations because that's just how passionate he is. He's not faking it. He's not trying to overact. He's not trying to be ridiculously dramatic because, you know. He's, he's just so waiting. excited because they're talking to me. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. That's Zach for you. 
Um, you know, and I guess you kind of have to know him a little bit. I mean, I'm not going to say I know him exceptionally well, but I know him. And well, you know I, him better than I do. I only met him the one time. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I never talk about it. So. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you kind of kind of meet him a few times to kind of get him. He's an intense fellow. He really is. He's very intense, very serious about his work. He's an artist with production. Um, you know, and, and the, the, that's how he started, really, is, you know, in filmography and whatnot. And I think he gives us a brilliant show. I, I really think it's a shame that people criticize it because it really is, you know, a documentary of, of Zach's heart and soul. And, and, and that in itself should be honored and respected. So, you know... That's why I'm saying this today. I, I, I really think it's an important thing. It's an important message to get out to all of the fans as well as the people who are the critics of the show. They need to hear it from somebody other than him and they need to hear it from from you know somebody other than social media who does not know what's going on. I was there. Okay, I've been... Um, I have worked with Zach now numerous times. Uh, there are going to be numerous times, I'm sure, in the future. Um, and the reason I work with him is because of the integrity of the show, because of the authenticity of the show, because it's not, you know, fabricated bullshit. All right. <laughs> I, I do it because of that. If I was, if believe me, you, if you follow my Twitter, you know, I am a no <laughs> bullshit person. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not afraid to say anything. I'm not afraid to, to create waves. I'm not afraid to be controversial. And I do not, I detest bullshit. And if there was even the, the, mo, the remote, modus, most remote chance that Ghost Adventures was fabricated in any way, you would not see me on it, ever. The fact that I'm, I've, 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 I'm continuing to work with them, I still work with them, should be a testimony to their authenticity. Okay. Um, so getting back to the rabbi, yes, he was a little rude. He was a little bit clueless. We had to fill him in. He wasn't sure what was going on. I don't know if his rudeness was just because of his disorientation. He seemed like a nice enough guy, um, but, you know, he didn't seem very comfortable with us. And um, so I just think he was terribly uncomfortable, not a good pick. And perhaps if they made a mistake, whoever made the mistake, I'm not sure who it was, but if there was a mistake made, and I think there was, it was in bringing that particular individual out without any, at least, preparation for what he was about to have to do. Um, that was poor. That was a poor choice on whoever made that decision. I don't. I don't blame Zach for it. Um, but that brings us to the next question: Why was there even a rabbi there to begin with when I was there? Well. Again, getting back to what I said at the beginning of the show, I was there because I was asked to be there as support to protect everybody. Um, I blessed everyone that wanted it going in. And so pretty much every single guest on the show was blessed going in. Even crew, okay, uh, was blessed going in. Those who wanted it, they could just, they just came and they got it, Okay. Um, and then after the show, whoever wanted it, some people were, were spreading rumors that Zach has, didn't, you know, Zach refused my blessing and he walked off. Um, no, um, I want to say that Zach always comes for a blessing after an investigation. The only time he didn't was in Sin City and that's because he took the ashes to the museum. Um, and he didn't come back. We fi we finished, we wrapped up the the case and we settled everything there we finished the exorcism we burned the box you see all that in the episode but um all of that was done before zach returned so that's the only time i've never had an opportunity to bless him and even in sin city you don't get to see it on camera but even before we started the the case all right zach came over and brought me a rosary and asked me to bless it so i've always given zach some kind of blessing whether it be physically on his person or if it's, you know, an object that he uses. He takes spiritual protection very seriously. They, his fans give him a hell of a time with this. I want to let the set the record straight. Zach is better protected than you think he is. I have done numerous blessings on him, very high-level blessings to protect him. Is it going to be the cure-all for the work that he does? No, of course not. He's doing dangerous stuff. He knows this. He's a big guy. He knows what he's getting into. 
Um, and he has a right to do this for the sake of the uh, 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 of the the work. Okay, um, but you know he's not going into it completely haphazardly. I think he does take it to an extreme. I think he needs to be a little bit more careful, just because I think he he might, he might underestimate the amount of drain and danger that he puts himself in with some of the things that he does. Um, but he does come for blessings. He's not like shunning them. He's not like sneaking off. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> do, do everybody, does everybody involved in the show get a blessing? No, they don't. I, I'm not going to call people out. I wish they all did, but then not everyone does. Uh, I'm not sure everyone on, that works on the show, you know, shares the same worldview that's compatible with, you know, or what at least they think is compatible with Catholicism. Personally, I think c- Catholicism is compatible with everything. And I don't, you know, <laughs> see any reason why anybody of any kind of religion or any kind of spirituality can't receive a Catholic blessing and benefit from it. Um, but, you know, some people, it's to each their own. Some people have different ways of dealing with it. And that's fine. Um, but I just want to make clear that Zach does come for blessings. And I have always given him, a, I've never denied him anything in that regard. Um, uh, so, you know, that takes care of that one. Um, why, so again, getting back, why was there a rabbi there to begin with? Um, okay. Well, uh, the rabbi was there because, um, and I don't have all the information on this. Okay. I have bits and pieces and I'm not going to speculate. It's not without, you know, anybody there being able to really come on the show and actually clarify this. But I get the impression, and anyone out there, including someone from the show, is more than welcome to say, no, Bishop, you're wrong. But I get the feeling that there is a deep misunderstanding as to the nature of the Dybbuk box. And I think people just thought it was a hell of a lot more Jewish than it is. And I think they felt that um, it would be seen as disrespectful if they had a Catholic bishop sealing what is a perceived to be a Jewish artifact. And I think they did it just to show respect, which is not a bad thing. You can't blame them for it. The problem is the rabbi had no clue how to, how to seal that thing. I can tell you right now. I talked to him. He didn't know. He didn't know how to seal it. Okay, so it would have been a really bad idea had they opened the box um, and use this guy because uh, with all due respect to Ra- Rabbi Harlick, he would not have been qualified to seal the box. I'm sorry. Just by being a rabbi doesn't qualify you. Just like being, you know, just by being a bishop doesn't automatically qualify you to be an exorcist. Okay. There, there, there's a charism that comes with it. And then there's a certain training that comes with it. That there's a certain skill level that comes with it that just by having a certain office doesn't give you automatically some kind of spiritual authority and power to jump into something that you really don't know how to do. Um, so, you know, could I have sealed the box? Of course I could have sealed the box. I have sealed numerous boxes, uh, with spirits in them, you know, um, some that would probably qualify as a Dybbuk. Um, but you know, I think because it was such a big production, they didn't want to be perceived as being disrespectful, but you know, honestly, it's not, you don't need a rabbi to seal a Dybbuk box. You need a, a qualified individual who understands, uh, the, the, the spiritual processes involved in this. Um, ultimately, and we're going to talk on the second half of the show, um, about the Dybbuk, but um, so I'm going to hold off on talking any more about it for now. We'll talk a little bit about what a Dybbuk is and how to seal it and what would need to be done and what would have happened if Zach had opened the box. And we'll we'll talk about that shortly. Um, but I just wanted to get through some of these um, questions. Somebody also said that I I don't know where they got this information from because it was certainly nothing I said. Somebody claimed that um, uh, the reason Zach didn't use me was because I refused to be a part of this dangerous activity and I and I refused to be an actor. I refused to go on and pretend, you know, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was no request to be an actor. There never is. It's not an act. 
it might be a television show, but it's it's what you see is real, okay? I'm telling you this from firsthand experience and numerous occasions of seeing it done, watching the show being recorded, okay? i have one of the few people that got to participate in a Ghost Adventures investigation several times. In fact, al- almost nobody can say that. And, and I can tell you, absolutely 100% authentic, okay? So, Dave Schrader can say that, and I have heard from Dave Schrader that... Zach is just a weirdness magnet. He's been on all kinds of investigations. In fact, he runs darkness radio events. Um, And I've been to twice odd follows asylum. I've investigated with Dave Schrader and with Chris Fleming and Bill chapel. And all of them say, you know, stuff like that just happens around Zach. He's just a weirdness magnet. And that's why he gets such great evidence. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, yeah, so, he really is very good. And I've gone out, I've gone out with a lot of the same types of equipment to the same types of places and gotten a lot of the same types of results. Yeah. So everything, I mean, it's totally authentic. Yeah. You know, I I dare anybody to to write a script and expect the ghosts to follow it because it, something's going to come through that equipment. <laughs> you would know immediately that if it was scripted, it would it would it would definitely you would you would. <laughs> You wouldn't be wondering, hmm, I, I bet that show's fake. That's got to be fake. You wouldn't, you would know it's fake. You wouldn't even be questioning it because it would be so obvious. The reason yeah. that you're, that there are people that are still kind of on the fence is because it is real. And, you know, it's so dramatic that, you know, your, 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 your faculties of reason kick in and say, how can this be real? You know, how can the paranormal right. be this prolific? And how could he be getting these results? But, I mean, you know, there are certain people that are able to get those results. Rachel in the chat room makes a great comment here. She says, if you refuse to be in there, why would you have even made an appearance? Exactly. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, Because that's exactly right. Why would I have even come on? Um, So, uh, yes, I was there um, for whatever Zach needed me to be there for. Um, I didn't deny him anything. I didn't refuse to be a part of it. Um, and you know, I want to say this, I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to say this and, you know, um, you know, you can beat me up later if I wasn't supposed to say it, but he actually uh, called me and wanted to talk before I made the commitment to the show because he wanted to make sure that I knew what was going to be going on. And to make sure that it was not a conflict of interest with my own spirituality and religion. That's how much respect he showed me in this regard. That's how ca- careful he was. And, 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 and just uh, overall, just an awesome guy that he even cared enough to say, you know what, I'd like you to be there, but I would understand if this is too much for you. And you don't really, you know, feel comfortable doing it. He wanted to make sure I was comfortable. And so, you know, it was quite the opposite of saying, no, Zach, I'm not going to be a part of this. It was more like Zach saying, here's what we're going to do. I would love you to be there, but I understand if you don't want to be. And Mike saying, you know what, Zach, I just want to be there. Make, keep, make sure everybody's safe because they're going to do it anyway. So it's best for me to be there. Um Great respect to Zach for that, and that should show all of you, again, more behind the scenes of really a side of Zach that maybe doesn't come across on social media or television. Um, you know, so I, I, that that hopefully clarifies that one. Now, uh, another one that, that, that came up, uh, and this is the last one I've got, and then I'll take your questions from the chat room or anything that, that uh, Joy might have noticed on Twitter. Um, is Lady Snake evil? (laughs) (laughs) Um, if you followed Twitter, um, after the show, you might have noticed that, um, Lady Snake, um, put up pictures and I retweeted them of us together having a really good conversation, laughing and, and, um, and, uh, you know, Okay, is she really evil? And, you know, what was that all about? A lot of people didn't care much for that whole sequence. Um, And, again, this was about live television. And just as Joy mentioned, and Joy, you made a great point here. It's worth mentioning again. 
um, because it's live television, things don't, you know, paranormal does not, you know, follow our commands. It doesn't uh, appear on command. Th- man, things don't manifest on command. Um, and so the best way to assure poten- potentially anything at all so that you don't have four hours of nothing happening is to bring people who can make things happen. Now, Lady Mm -hmm. Snake is one of these kinds of people. She is a a witch who practices a type of, um, if I'm understanding correctly, a type of generational witchcraft. And um, that's the more powerful, far more authentic form of witchcraft when you are generational and not somebody who just, you know, read a book and self-initiated into it because the book said you could. Um, And she is, what I said on Twitter, a master of the archetypes that she works with and when you do when you do work in the occult okay at a high level when you're practiced and very skilled and you know what the hell you're doing and you work with the occult on a professional level you are going to have to have the same mastery over the light that you do or or rather over the dark that you do over the light You can't say, I'm going to come all into the light and completely ignore the darkness. And guess what? It's not exclusive to witches. Because even as a Catholic exorcist, I have to be as informed and as skillful and as engaged with the devil as I have to be with God. Otherwise, I would have no effect whatsoever you wonder why i'm so successful in my work that is why because i'm not afraid of the devil he knows who's boss and that's christ and christ is my source of grace and there's nothing satan can do nothing that he can do when i exercise that grace nothing so there's no threat i don't have to be afraid of him i don't have to run and hide and pretend that oh it was satan It's Lucifer. Oh, my God. What's he going to do to me this time? Doesn't mean they're not lashing out and there's, you know, casualties of the battle that happens from time to time. And I've talked about what those are like. And there's certainly risk to being an exorcist. There's no question about that. But I know in the end, Christ's grace is what empowers me. Christ is the true exorcist. I am the facilitator of the grace that he gives me to give to those who need it. And the devil has no power over me whatsoever. So in a sense, while Lady Snake is working in this same department at a different level, she's obviously not using the grace of Christ, um, but she is definitely using mastery in order to facilitate the things that she's able to do. She can access darker mischievous archetypes as well as you know things that are beneficial and help people and more often than not from what i know about lady snake she does a lot more helping people than she's setting things free in museums i mean she was asked to do this okay she went there and did it because she was asked to and you know like all of us um we are you know we are fascinated by the paranormal and that means that some of us have to engage and take risks so I actually enjoyed my interactions with Lady Snake. I thought she was a wonderfully delightful person. And I would go out and have a dram with her any day. Um, in fact, next time I'm in the UK, I'm going to look her up. I'm going to say, hey, look, I'm here. Let's go have a drink. <laughs> I will. And I, I mean, no, I, 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 I absolutely enjoyed her thoroughly. So, you know, no, she's not evil. She just has mastery over the dark archetypes, which can make it look like she's evil, but she's not. Um, and there were some people who were like, you know, why is she saying the weird things she's saying? She's in the grips of those archetypes because she knows how to wield them. Yes. And so she's talking from the point of view of them. Yes. It's yes. not necessarily and her speaking. That's what happened with the little confrontation between her and Patty Negri. Exactly. And the, and the last encounter. That's what was going on there. Yes. Yes, um, absolutely. No, she's a wonderful person. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no question about that. Lady Snake's great. All right. Um, we are uh, pretty much almost at the top of the hour here. So we're going to take a little break here. And then we're going to come back um, 
And we're going to talk about the Dybbuk Box and take your questions. All right? I'll give you a little more information about it from personal experience. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, everyone, to Vestiges After Dark. We're getting ready here for the second half of the show. We'll be talking about the Dybbuk box and sealing it up. More about Dybbuk's and taking your questions as well. Anything that you have about Ghost Adventures Live, anything that I can answer, I'll do my best. Don't go away. Welcome back, everybody. Microphone's giving me trouble here. 
And, uh, you know, I just wanted to mention real quick, if you like this show, um, you know, your donations are what keep it on the air. So by all means, if you can donate, if you feel inclined to donate to uh, the Vestiges After Dark program, please uh, go to my website, the website of the church, actually, at esotericcatholic.org or nicolan.org. Um, and uh, just simply look at the right hand side of the screen and you'll see a donation button right, th- right there on the right. Um, that's esotericcatholic.org or nicolaean.org. N I C H O L E A N.org. And um, again, your generous donations are what keep the show going. So I appreciate that. Um, okay, so let's, Joy, let's talk a little bit about the Dybbuk box and sealing it up and what would have happened if uh, Zach would have chosen to open it that night instead of disappointing all the fans and doing the right thing. <laughs> 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 I mean, come on. What more do you really want that the show's not scripted? I mean, if it was scripted, do you think there's a chance in hell they wouldn't have opened that box? <laughs> no, there's, there's no way they wouldn't have opened it. And that's the thing is the the people that I saw that were complaining about that, they were the people who really don't believe that it's real anyway. Right, the, right. the the fans, the the real fans, the ones that know and believe that, you know, they see the beginning and say, you know, some people believe in ghosts, some people don't. They're the ones who do. Yeah. And they're the ones who know, don't open that box. And they were all glad that he didn't. Right. So right. the real the real fans, the ones you really want to you know, please, they were happy with it. <laughs> and that's what the, the jerks. Yeah, the jerks. They were, I mean, there were people going, you know, a simple Internet search proves the Dybbuk box isn't even real. It's all a hoax. Well, <laughs> have, 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 you know, there's going to be websites saying that everything's a hoax. Well, there's I, trolls everywhere. I mean, everywhere. I'm trolled all the time. I mean, my gonna... biggest troll is the Church of Satan. I mean... <laughs> They don't yeah. realize. They they think they're annoying me. They have no idea how entertaining they are to me. Um, you know, sometimes I just don't even respond. I just sit there and just watch all of them flock over like you know vultures, um, yeah. and say their say their things, and it just makes me laugh. You know, Peter in the chat room is asking a question that perhaps Joy, you would be um, the best one to answer. Uh, he wants to know what the significance of the Dybbuk box is and what its history is. Would you want to maybe give a, a, a brief summary of the box before we start talking about it? Well, I'm not sure that I have really enough information. Well, what do you know I, about it? Just talk about what I, you know about I know, it. I know that it was a box that belonged to a Holocaust survivor. Um, they're calling it a wine cabinet, but what it looks like to me is like one of those – uh, boxes like you would put your your wedding stuff in there, like the the Torah scroll from uh, when you got married, the you know the the scripture that was read, mm-hmm. and that ring that looks like a castle or a house or something, and that they they would put that in there. I saw that I think I think it was at the Eisenhower Presidential Museum. They had one, something like that. I think because there is there was some stuff about you know World War II going on, and that was. It, that's what it looks like to me. But of course, if it's a wine cabinet, you know, what do I know? <laughs> but it looks, it, that's what it reminds me of. And it yeah, seems right. to have, you know, items in there that are unusual that you wouldn't put in uh, a wine cabinet. Like right. who would put blocks of hair in there? Right. But we don't know. I don't know what it was for. I don't really know a lot about, you know, the the history of what they would have used boxes like that at the time for. I know that's one of the options. They also, they drank wine. So it could be a wine cabinet. It could be anything. Yeah. You know, it, it could just be a, a personal devotional item. I, I don't know. But I know that this woman survived the Holocaust and she kept this box with her. And somehow all of the pain got attached to this box. Which we've seen. I mean, that's kind yeah. of the root of... Uh, you know, created demons as well as creating um, egregores that can be empowered by people's fear and hatred and uh, all of their negative emotions zeroed in and focused into something, which was what actually makes the box so dangerous. I, I, I'm not yeah. even convinced that there's a Dybbuk in there. I, 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 I think it really is a, um, uh, a created thought form. 
uh, Atalpa. I do too. Yeah. Because it, it reminds me so much of my own situation that I, I remember, you know, before you even went out there, I was saying, you know, I want to open this. I want to meet this thing because yeah. I think it's a, a, a created thought form from the pain of going through the Holocaust because the horror. I mean, I've been through some nasty stuff, but what they went through, I can't even imagine. Right. I mean, I went I went to the museum in Atlanta and saw the Holocaust exhibit and it just it was it'll tear your guts out. It is crazy the things that people put other people through oh yeah so, and now of course this thing is in the imagination of all the people and that's just feeding it and everything else that's in that museum that's archetypally active yes yes so absolutely you know that's what makes it so dangerous that it has the spirit of a very um, perhaps one of the darkest times in modern history, if not the darkest time in modern history. I think you could actually argue that it is the darkest time in modern history. Um, all, you know, being zeroed into this one small space. Um, and that's what really makes it so deadly and dangerous. So what would have happened if Zach had opened the box? Well, if you might have noticed on the show, it's... it's um, Got a circle of salt around it. Looks like there was some sage around it. The sage isn't going to do anything. I hate to break it to anybody, but that's not going to help. Um, the salt, if it was properly exercised, might have helped. Even if it was ritually charged, uh, you know, using some kind of um, witchcraft, could could potentially, you know, be sufficient to to keep it contained. But certainly, the best solution would be to seal the room. And create a Dybbuk box within a Dybbuk box uh, by creating a Dybbuk box out of the room. And that way, if you wanted to open it, you know, it could get out of the box but wouldn't be able to leave the room. You can ritually seal spirits very, relatively easy. We, you know, we do it all the time um, at the mission church. It's part of the job. It's part of what we do. And um, and so, you know, that's the safest way to deal with these things so that they can't get out and and wreak havoc on people. Um, so if he had opened it, there's a very good chance that it would have latched right onto him because I really do feel he's the target. At the beginning of the show, you see me, for those of you who watched it, you saw me giving Zach some preliminary advice um, and some of my own personal concerns about what he was preparing to do that night. And, um, you know, he had put out some articles about some dreams that he was having that uh, really disturbed him. I don't want to go into the content of those dreams because I don't know what he shared publicly and what he shared privately. I don't really know the extent of that. So I don't want to give, you know, say anything that I'm not supposed to say. Um, but <clears throat> suffice it to say that he had very disturbing dreams of things that, you know, did, have not happened that could have happened. Um, that, you know, were very dark. And uh, I do feel that whatever is attached to that box would have intended to carry out those things any way that it could. And um, it, it certainly going in there without the proper protections and in place, that would have been a possibility. So he made the right decision by not opening it because, you know, not enough of those protections to my satisfaction had been done. Um, and I think it could have been very disastrous had he opened the box. Honestly, I really do. Um, would the rabbi have helped? No, I think it would have made matters a whole lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, Quite possibly. Not, oh, yeah. I mean, because not only did he not know what really what to do, um, but... I, I honestly think that if it really was some dark Holocaust spirit, um, a rabbi might be the last thing it wants to see. You know, honestly, because you don't know. You don't know which one it comes. You, you know, everyone's assuming it's like some kind of Jewish spirit in there. And, and, and everyone's assuming that like you keep your religion after you die. You don't. Surprise, surprise. You don't die with your religion. It goes out the window with the rest of you. All that's left is the raw spiritual matter that is you and God. No religions, nothing. Okay? So you don't retain your, your ethnicity either. You don't retain your Jewishness, you know, when you die. So if it's a Jewish spirit, it won't have any, it wouldn't care 
whether or not it was a rabbi or Mickey Mouse, it, 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 it would have had no significance to it. And furthermore, if it would have been the spirit of something that was on the opposite side of the Holocaust, something like a German Nazi, then it actually might have latched out at um, something that would have seen as opposing energy like a rabbi. And the rabbi could have been in danger and he didn't believe in it, but he might have actually believed in it after that happened. Um, so these are all concerns that I had as I watched it unfold and was prepared to deal with in case it was needed. It would have been very, very interesting to have to go and remove a spirit attachment from a rabbi. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not even sure he would have accepted that because he really didn't seem all that impressed with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he even said at one point, he's like, why did he bring Jesus here? Why do we need Jesus? And um, oh, <laughs> it's really very, very funny, um, you know, but anyway, uh, you know, it would have been a bad choice. So th- they made the right one. Um, what what would she what should we have done, uh, you know, if he had opened it and they would have called me in? Well, what we would have done is we would have we would have properly contained the spirit and uh, sealed it back in. Now, that would have been, of course, what Zach would have wanted. Now, what would have been the best thing to do okay is a dibic wants one if it's truly a dibic it only wants one thing and that's release it's not it's vengefulness uh, is all about it's being attached and trapped okay usually imprisoned by its own hostilities and so it will seek out people who can help it, and it will actually lash out at those who are not, which is really, I think, to a certain extent, some of the reaction that when Zach talks about, you know, he's got this connection to this box. Um, what I fear that it is, honestly, is that it's being kept as an exhibit and it really wants to be set free. Um, and so, you know, setting it free would end the, 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 the problem. Um, and at some point he might need this. I don't know. It'll be up to him to tell me what he wants from, from it. I don't ever force my, my, uh, myself on anybody. I don't force people to get help. Um, but you know, honestly, I found it interesting for those of you who were observant, uh, audience members that night. You might have noticed that the spirit box actually called for the bishop. Um, yeah. Did you see that, Joy? Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I didn't see it at the time that it happened, but I saw the clip that somebody posted where it said bishop and then they reacted. It said bishop and then they moved on. This yeah. other stuff was happening, too. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. And, and they did. They did. They, they, they kind of missed it. I don't know if, and if that would have been caught if they would have made different decisions i don't know um i hope though and i haven't talked to zach about it since but i hope that if he decides to open it again at some point in the future and fans might demand it of him he might feel pressure to do it um i do hope he has me there in the room with the proper protections in place and um and really, you know, let's just leave the rabbis at the, the House of Representatives, you know, to give prayers there, because I think that's where they're I think this particular rabbi would have been better suited to that than than this type of dark mystical stuff. Uh, you know, it just wasn't it wasn't his area. OK. Um, and that way, that would be the safest way to handle it, honestly. But. You know, it's 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 his piece. It's you know, it's Zach's property, and it's it's his prerogative what he wants to do. And um, you know, I will be there in whatever capacity I can be there because my only motivation is to keep everybody safe. Um, but that's really all that I have to say about it. Um, so I don't know what questions have been coming on in the chat room. Have you noticed any um, joy that we should well, be t- answering? There, there was somebody who uh, made the call. You know, he talked about how Zach commented that he had a strong connection to the box or to the entity in the box, and you know, 
the last I would think the last thing you would want is a connection to whatever is inside that box. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't think he wants the connection. It's just there. I, I have felt that thing calling to me. I, I know, you know, the pull of a, an object I've been wanting to touch Annabelle for decades. Like, I'm going to get a chance to do that now. Thanks, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and places, there have been places that called to me that I just, I felt like I needed to go there. Yeah. And I would know, you know, maybe I shouldn't follow through on this calling. <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, it, you don't choose what calls out to you. You don't choose what grabs you. It just grabs you. <laughs> right. And if you're passionate about the work, you know, I think sometimes that does influence your judgment. I do. Yeah. Um, and I think it does. And certainly in Zach's case, um, that is on the table for the kinds of problems that he's experiencing um, right now with that box. So, I mean, there is a way to resolve it, a very easy way to resolve it. Honestly, it's, you know, the Dipic box is really a uh, kind of a simple case. Honestly, it really is. It's not, um, I mean, it, it's, it's every bit as dangerous as they say it is, but it's also one of the easiest things to fix. Um, yeah. Teresa in the chat room is asking, do I think post Malone was cursed by the box? Oh yeah, absolutely. No question about it. I think yeah. anybody that would uh, come there to treat it as a um, circus sideshow would um, would be at risk, honestly. Um, yeah. It's an exhibit. And um, well, how would you feel if you were an exhibit? <laughs> Imagine if you were imprisoned and put on display. Um, you know, if you're already angry, that's going to make you a hell of a lot more angry. Um <laughs> So I think, you know, yeah, Post Malone, I think, did get a little piece of that wrath. Um, and these are things that we should not play with. I mean, they really are not. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there, there are ways to do it safely. And, you know, if he needs me for that, I can help with that for sure. I mean, it's what I do 24-7 um, practically. Um, Janet says she thinks Aaron was greatly affected by the box. Yeah, I think I think actually all yeah. of them. Yeah, he them almost were. opened it. <laughs> yeah, I know he did. He did. Um, and you know, I, I I think I think all of them were being adversely affected by a lot of the things in there. Really, um, Abel asks. I'm not sure if you've answered this question, but any advice of going to um, Going to the museum, I'm assuming it says Sake Museum. I'm not sure what that means, but I'm, I'm assuming he means museum. Um, yeah, and I, I've talked about this before. I haven't talked about it tonight, but it's probably worth mentioning. If you plan on going to the haunted museum and you're worried about bringing something back home or something of that nature, well, if you're if you're Catholic, then you've already got your solution. Okay, the very simple thing for Catholics to do is go to mass before you go. Okay, get up early, go to Mass in the morning. Las Vegas has uh, a church right there on the Strip. And, um, you know, go to Mass and uh, get blessed by the priest. You can even ask him, you know, could, could you give me a special blessing? You don't have to tell him why. Um, they'll usually do it. And if you're not Catholic, you can still go to Mass and go up for communion and keep your hands crossed across your chest. And um, and then that will be the cue that you're not coming up to receive communion. You're just coming to um, get a blessing from the priest. The priest will bless you. Uh, and and that th that's the best. That would be the best way t to go. Maybe take some holy water with you as well, and bless yourself with the holy water before and after. Um, that's all you really need. Um, you know, for those that are of other religions or denominations, well, I mean, that's gonna the answers to that are gonna vary based upon the level of sophistication that exists within your denomination for spiritual protection. Some don't even really consider it more than superstition. Others, you know, are as serious about it as the Catholics are. So um, a lot of it, you know, depends upon that. But yeah, blessings, uh, you know, Holy Water, St. Michael's book, all of that would be a great way of protecting yourself. Um, as well as asking for protection, you know, uh, going, going, asking for, you know, angelic protection upon entering the museum. 
um, and so that nothing uh, latches on. Now that doesn't mean you're going <laughs> to be guaranteed to not walk out with something um, or to be affected while you're in there. Yes, but, Julie, uh, pray the rosary every day, y'all. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, <laughs> no question about that. Um, we've all seen the results of of the rosary. In fact, I've got a bad, uh, very bad case coming up here on on Sunday. Joy knows about it, but I don't know if I've talked about it um, publicly. But we've got a, a very uh, serious case, uh, Sister Mary Joan and uh, and I, as well as Sister Maximilian and uh, the rest of the clergy are, are gearing up uh, to prepare ourselves for um, a very uh, full-scale solemn exorcism on Sunday, Sunday evening. And uh, this is one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Um, definitely... A, 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 a profoundly uh, severe case with the clients very close to integration point if not already there um, and uh, we have our work cut out for for us so make sure that you say some prayers and I can tell you right now um, the rosary is going to be um, the standard uh, MO of the entire evening um, so that we can just gain the intercession of the um, Theotokos. And the, even uh, though I'm not there, I'm going to be praying the whole time. Yeah, I might, I might have to stop after you know a while because I don't know when it's going to end. But <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be praying the rosary over and over again as much as you can. But you know, we're yeah. pre- we're preparing for a late night, so it <laughs> starts at about nine p.m. and we are prepared to be there until the sun rises, if necessary. We want to break this thing, yeah. and uh, we might have to just keep doing it until it breaks because I I really want to free this client. And, uh, you know, it, it takes their toll when you have to do, you know, an exorcism every month. Um, we've yeah. already performed five on her. Um, but this is the first time we're actually doing a formal um, solemn. So, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll beat it this time. Um, Abel asked, did I tour the museum when I went? No, I did not, actually. I never got to go inside. It was set up for the production, and uh, I was not not really a part of the production. So I never written, went inside, but um, Joy and I as well as Sister Mary Joan, Sister Maximilian, Sister Kateri, will be um, uh, touring the museum uh, in January um, as, as tourists, not as, uh, not as uh, <laughs> people working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so um, I will see everything hopefully then. Uh, and if Zach's in town, hopefully he'll be able to meet up with us. Um, okay, any other questions here? Let me see if I've missed any of these. Did you see any others? I know a lot of people um, coming in, but when I'm talking, I'm not looking. Y- you catch them for, before I get a chance to tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be digging in the back here, see if I see anything. Um, yeah, Andre, uh, 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 Andrew, Andrew says, I think the most dangerous thing in the museum is the Demon House exhibit, which I didn't even know existed until the live broadcast. Seeing that text oh, yeah. message that was sent to Chris Fleming from... Uh, Adam, Adam Bly was unreal. Bishop, what do you think of all that? Did you know about any of those? Yeah, I knew about. I knew that the Demon House stairs were in there and some of the artifacts. Yeah. Um, you know, and and yeah, that's. I don't know if it's the most dangerous thing in there, but it's it's definitely, you know, any of anything that had a demonic attachment on that property certainly could have been infused into the structure of the house, and. Um, the stairs seem to be an active point. So, yeah, I, w- I would say that there's definite risk to that one. Um, I'm looking over here. I don't know if I see any others on here. But if you guys have other questions, feel free to ask them now. If I missed it, go ahead and ask it again um, so that I can um, answer it to the best of my ability. I don't think there's really anything on Twitter that I saw that. Uh, have you listened to any of Gary Galka's evidence? I have. I have. I, I think he, yeah. he he's really very good at isolating and slowing down the speech so that you can understand it. Yeah. Gary was a was a really interesting uh, individual. I really enjoyed my conversations with him. I enjoyed it with everybody. M- Michael and Marty were great. Uh, <laughs> Patty Negri went to dinner with uh, sister. I, I went to Chinese, had Chinese with P- um, Patty Negri, Sister Mary Joan, and um, Darren. 
Darren Evans and uh, you know it was a wonderful occasion uh, sat and talked Darren's a great guy I mean that you know so, so unfortunate to hear that he has pneumonia right now and has been in the hospital mm. um, but yeah, I'll tell you there was I, I, I think I'm, I'm surprised I didn't get really sick on this trip because everybody at the casino everybody we came in contact with it seemed was just hacking up a lung um mm. and i'm like oh my god I, i'll be a miracle if i ever get out of here because usually when i travel i get a little under the weather anyway um mm. and um man I, I, my immune system must be really on 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 par right now <laughs> yeah well plus i uh I, when I saw all the pictures of you with all the, the people, I just got so excited because I see you every week. So I've stopped <laughs> associating you with ghost adventures and I sometimes <laughs> forget that that's how I know you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because, you know, there's a very small group of people that um, that knew me from my previous podcasts, you know, because I've been I've been doing this kind of stuff for years you know long before i was ever on ghost adventures and um, there are people that knew me from that time and you know have a hard time relating me to the identity that i now have today and then there you know of course are the people that only know me from the show and then there are the people like yourself who only knew me from the show but now know me you know more behind the scenes than from television because now we work to a certain extent together um, and it's it's funny to see the the different dynamic unfold in each in each <laughs> category, um, you know. Yeah. So uh, this is an interesting question. Um, Janet asks, "Am I worried that a demon will attach to me during exorcisms?" Um, no, I'm not. Uh, I, the types of protections that I take place would preclude anything like that from happening. So. Um, I'm more concerned about a demon attaching to somebody else that's present, but not so much to me. Sister Mary Joan and I are fairly um, uh, immune to the, the the risk of that happening. Not that there's not there there are risks. They can attack us, but attachment would not be possible. Um, Abel says, well, with prayers and protecting ourselves, we should be okay if we step inside the demon house, right? Um, well, <laughs> again, that, a lot of that depends upon you, you know, your yeah. own relationship to God. How strong is it? Yeah, I mean, if you're only going to God when you're going in the de demon house, then I would say probably don't go in the demon house because you're only going to get back from God what you've given him. But I mean, if you're talking about a long standing, decades old relationship of love and respect and, and, and prayer, then I would say that you have no worries at all going in the demon house because uh, yeah, your relationship. Yeah, I think you'd be fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kelly asked, did you see Zach's episode with Gary and his daughter? Yes, I did, in fact. And uh, it was one of my favorites. Um, that yeah, was a, I That was a that deviation one. from their usual. Did you see that one? You saw that one, Joy? Yeah, yeah, I loved that one. Yeah. It was very I, touching. It, it really is. Um, you know... It, it it definitely I think the evidence in that one was was dramatic. Um, I have my concerns about that case um, because, you know, anytime a spirit hangs around for too long, there is what I refer to as um, uh, spiritual degradation. And as a spirit degrades, they become less and less who they were. And the degradation actually w sort of matches more of the patterns of entropy, which tend to get dark and disturbing. And eventually, you know, if you keep a spirit around for a long enough time, or if a spirit's attached enough to you for a long enough time, it can actually degrade into a, what it would be a wrathful spirit or for all intents and purposes, a Dybbuk. Which um, actually makes total sense because like if, if you're beaming energy, you know, whether you're, turning on a flashlight or whatever it is, the higher frequency waves diminish first. Mm -hmm. The lower frequency waves are what remain, which is why you, you know, yeah. like you, when you have the, the retina burn on your eye, yeah. it turns kind of a reddish color, yeah. but it might start off as kind of blue. And that's yeah. the same effect. Yes. So yes. 
That's Precisely true. When the, when the spirit is degrading, you know, all the good, happy things are the first to leave. So then after a while, all that's left over is all the anger and the rage and the sorrow and the despair because that's all that's left of them by then because those are the lowest wavelengths of emotion. Right. So right. eventually – you're going to, you know, any spirit that's just in a state of degradation is going to become nothing but a wrathful spirit toward the end. Towards the end, which is why mm-hmm. you don't want to keep things around. I've had actually no. had clients that you know had you know grandpa died or something, and grandma is still alive and misses him and and knows that he's still very much around, and um, you know they call me and say, "Oh, I'm having disturbances in my house." And so, you know, I think sometimes they think that I do this for fun. I don't do this for fun. It's a, it's work <laughs> for me, okay? So I don't actually, I'm not really entertained by paranormal investigation. It's it's my job. And honestly, when I'm not working, I would rather be doing just about anything else. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know what they think. But when I'm called to do a case and I take a case, it's because I want to fix the case. I want to resolve the issue. It's I'm not there to get evidence for you and say, Hey, look, it's grandpa, you know, (laughs) congratulations. You made contact. That's not why I do. I take cases. Um, and, and I, you know, no, my job is there. Oh yeah. It's grandpa. And I'm going to get rid of him now. (laughs) 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 And they don't want to hear that. And I mean, actually we had a client, um, a little while back, um, this very scenario. Grandpa had passed on recently in the house. They were having disturbances. And they said, um, they said, you know, uh, we want you to come out. And I said, okay. Um, but I always give preliminary instructions. And when they found out that I was going to release them, they said, oh, don't bother. Don't cancel. We don't, we don't want you to come and do that. It's like, okay, so what are you going to do? Waste my time? Why? Because I was the guy on Ghost Adventures and you want to use my, all my equipment so that you can... <laughs> I mean, obviously, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, no, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't exist for your entertainment. I'm not a, I'm not a uh, you know, a, uh, a sideshow for you to, you know, do parties and, you know, private events in your house. Um, you know, if I get called and I take a case, it's because I want to fix the problem. So we, we, we are very clear about that now, but this family did not want to deal with that. And so, uh, you know, we told him, look, okay, he's grandpa. It was going to seem like grandpa for a while. One of these days, you know, you're not gonna be able to distinguish him from a demon. It's going to be the same as like when somebody has Alzheimer's. Yes. And yeah. they gradually forget stuff and they just, un- oh, after gosh. a while, forget who you are and they forget who they are. Yeah. And then they're just acting on raw emotion. And, you know, if grandpa was in World War II, do you really want him hanging around if he doesn't know who you are <laughs> and all he knows is anger? Exactly. I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, you don't want that. Kelly asked no. a great question here. Um, she says, what about those people in Indonesia that keep the dead in their home for as long oh, as they yeah. think it takes for the spirit to leave? Actually, it's not just Indonesia. This happens in, 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 in a lot of places in Asia. It's yeah. part of Buddhist Vajrayana practice. Um, and that actually is a good thing. That's actually yeah. a good thing because that's what you're supposed to do. We don't do that in the West. This is why we have so many attachments here. Because we're not doing proper after after death care, we we're we're we're, we're, we're even cremating even keeping them, them a couple of years. Um, well, it, uh, on on the afterlife special uh, expedition unknown, yeah, uh, they went. You know, Josh Gates walked into a a person's house, and mom and dad were laying there in coffins, They're still there, and they'd been yeah. mummified, and they'd been there for years. That's a bit excessive. It, it doesn't take it that is. long. <laughs> no, yeah, um, three days to maybe three weeks. Um, would be you know, three weeks is pushing it, pushing it, um, and certainly in Buddhism they don't they don't hang on to that long, but ideally, you know, the proper aftercare for a recently deceased individual would be no embalming, no autopsies, um, nothing, um, simply letting them stay in place where they died, preferably at home, not in a hospital. Um, hospitals are terrible places to die, so try to avoid that if, if you at all can. Um, and and to be left alone for a period of about three days, 
typically within the 72 hour period, um, the average individual will break apart from the body and be able to move on peacefully. Um, and certainly there's certain rituals that can be performed uh, that aid that process. The Bardo Thodol is one such document that Buddhists employ to help with the releasing process. What's happening in Indonesia, that's a bit excessive. Um, but, you know, I, I am an advocate. I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for leaving the recently deceased alone until the signs of release are there. Um, now, for some people in the West, they would really um, turn their noses up at what those signs are. Um, one of the signs in, in, in the Vajrayana uh, Tibetan uh, forms of Buddhism is when the back of the skull liquefies and the brain spills out, or what was oh. the brain. That's, the, that's their primary physical telltale sign that the spirit's released. And, you know, it's messy, it stinks, um, but it's natural. And that's as normal to them as just about anything else that we do that's kind of, you know, I mean, probably no worse to them as would be going to the bathroom to us. You know, it's kind of a not the most pleasant thing in the world that humans do, but we got to do it. And, you know, <laughs> you wash your hands. Um, you know, same thing with taking care of the deceased in this way. So, um, you know, that's the best way to die. That that gives the spirit the best opportunity for release, assuming that spirit was, you know, skillful to begin with. We talked a little bit on yeah. Twitter about skillful death today. And of course, there's somebody asking, what if the person has unfinished business? Wouldn't their spirit stay around to finish it? Yeah, it probably would. That's an attachment. You're not supposed to have those. Right. <laughs> you need to let go of your business. business. Once right. you're dead, you just let go. It's yeah. over. Right. Unfinished business. Who, care, who cares about that business? It's, you're <laughs> who cares done. about that business? <laughs> 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 You know, the unfinished business thing is an issue, though. I mean, it is something that we definitely yeah. see. It's a real problem. Typically, it tends to be murder victims that have this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, because they feel that there's some need for justice or vindication. Well, guess what? You, you were going to die anyway. Maybe not this soon, but you're going to die anyway. And your best chance now is leave it all behind. It's done. It's over. You don't need justice anymore. You don't mean vindicate. Let God take care of it from this point yeah, forward. Yeah, it's not going to reattach you to your body, so just let go. Right. You can't come back. You're not going to raise from the dead because, you know, your 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 murderer was caught. It's not going to help yeah. you. So, you know, I you know it's kind of harsh. People, you know, don't always like when I talk like that, but it's the truth. I mean, we have to take death seriously. We don't take death seriously enough, and we're very much afraid of it, and and we're very much taboo about it, you know. I mean, right down to... How we even handle, you know, the whole embalming process is just a horrible thing. Horrible, horrible, horrible thing. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of, oh, you know, grandma's got to look like she's sleeping. Oh, look how peaceful she is. Um, you know, it's, it's all a little ruse for the, for the living that we play these mind games with ourselves. And, and it's really for the living that they, they started doing the embalming. Yeah. It's not benefiting the dead. And that's one of the things that I, I noted in uh, when I was watching Expedition Unknown, uh, the one where he was uh, participating in, in a burial in, not burial, but uh, the burning. And they, they dipped the, the body in the Ganges. Yeah. And uh, part of your karma depends on how the people around you handle your funeral. Yeah. Because if you don't have the proper rituals, you won't move on and have good karma and, and have that release. Yeah. So it's dependent on the people who are living to make sure you have that proper send off. It's not to benefit them. It's to benefit you so that you have your rest. Yeah. But we've made it all about the living yeah. And taking care of our inability to let go. So grandma has to look like she's sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, you can't buy the, you know, the, 
the fifty dollar box or shroud and just throw them into the ground. We have to buy these fifty thousand dollar coffins that are guaranteed to preserve the corpse for fifteen years minimum, um, because it has this nice, beautiful, airtight seal. Please explain to me the <laughs> even the, how we can even rationalize that as a, as a as an intelligent species. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I mean, we, I took a course in undergraduate school, uh, and I've mentioned this before on the air, uh, you know, called um, Death and Dying. The Psychology of Death and Dying is what it was called. And one of our field trips, we tried to take a field trip to the morgue, but it got canceled. So we went to a funeral parlor down the road instead. And uh, they gave us a full tour of this, except for one area that had an actual corpse in it. We weren't allowed in there. Um, but you know, th they took us into their showroom where, and a lot of us had never, you know, had to deal, thank God, with, uh, having to prepare the aftercare for someone. And, um, so this was all a new experience. Certainly was for me. Um, and, uh, they, they took us to the showroom. It was like a used car lot where they had all the different models of coffins. And, you know, you start out with this box that's like maybe a few hundred dollars all the way up to this. $50,000 monstrosity and you know I was trying to figure it out I'm saying okay other than the ornate design why what makes this one I asked him I said what makes this one almost $49,600 more than this one and he said oh well that one guarantees the preservation of the body for a minimum of 15 years and I looked at him <laughs> and I said and why would they need that and he didn't know what to say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I like what they do in India. Personally, I think the people who do the best job with death are, are Muslims, uh, not Muslims, uh, uh, Hindus. Because the Hindus have the whole uh, mythos of the Ganges. And they mm -hmm. have those, that, that, that cask that deals <clears throat> with death. And they have these fires burning that have literally been burning off the side of the Ganges for thousands of years, never having gone out. And yeah. death is a communal affair. And the body is thrown in there, completely exposed. And everyone sits there and the family sits there and meditates around the, 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 the burning corpse. And then when the when the corpse is fully consumed, the ashes are collected and thrown into the Ganges so that the spirit can move on to hopefully moksha, which is sort of yeah. like the release. It's the release of the spirit. Um, and oh God, that's beautiful. I, I, I yeah. hate our our modern ways. I hate the whole coffin thing. Now, you know, in the Christian world, the burial is the preferred method. Um personally i think re uh, i think uh cremation is fine um as long as the ashes are properly ritually dealt with not retained not converted into jewelry that you wear around your neck but you know is actually that the rite of christian burial is performed whether the whether it be buried in whole or a in a cremated form what is important to re remember is that the ashes are the corpse the ashes don't change the dynamic energy of a spirit attachment so if a person wasn't ready to go and they are hanging on because of the unfinished business that we were talking about a little while ago then they're going to be just as attached to their ashes as they would be to their entire intact corpse so this is serious business um and this is why we must take good care um, of the dead a proper way. And I'm sorry, the funeral, the whole funeral industry, it's bullshit. The whole damn thing. Um, it's awful. You should be put in a shroud, at the very least, put in a shroud, buried in the ground, ritually buried by a priest. Uh, and cremation is perfectly fine. Personally, I would rather have a Tibetan sky burial or to be burned at the Ganges. I think that would be wonderful. And uh, I think it's yeah. actually in my will last time I checked. I don't know if they'll be able to carry it out, um, but I'm hoping for at least the Ganges. The sky burial, probably not yeah. going to be uh, possible. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of a lot of more possibilities are opening up. 
Um, I, I keep track of, uh, the order of the good death. Yeah. And there's a, there's a mortician who, uh, she likes to like do YouTube videos, fun little YouTube videos about, you know, fun facts about death and fun facts about burials and Hey, what kind of options are there? Well, it depends on what state you're in. Yeah. And on, on her YouTube, she goes on about, you know, all the different kinds of methods that you can go to. So you don't have to buy, you know, a, a coffin that's going to keep your corpse intact for 15 years. Right. Right. <laughs> you, you can, you can opt for something, you know, you don't have to go to a, a funeral home. It, if you know how to convince them that you're not going to do a funeral home. <laughs> right. Cause sometimes you have to convince them, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. You have to, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like Ra- Rachel said, she paid $7,000 for her brother's cremation and memorial service and they wanted fifteen thousand dollars for burial. I mean that that's that's robbery. That's crazy. That is it immoral. Is. It's immoral. Honestly, you, you know, for me I would be like spend, you know, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars on a flight to India and then, you know, let the let the Hindus take care of it, me. Um yeah. you know, but I, I I mean I don't have many attachments, if any at all. Um and I work on whatever I might have every single day. So I hope to die in a in a in a in a as much a skillful state as I possibly can. And you know, if you leave me on the side of the street, I'm probably not going to give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so let's see. Any other um, any other questions here? Uh, Abel says, "Is there any way you can talk about the Antichrist sometimes in the future?" Uh, or sometime in the future and clear up some confusions that people might have about it, even if it's worth talking about. Um, yeah, well, I can just briefly talk about that. Um, you know, people oh, yeah. have this misconception that the Antichrist is a like some kind of manifestation of Satan um, that will come at the end times um, and, you know, precede the coming of Jesus to mislead the faithful and bring them into a state where they lose their grace and they, you know, lose their soul or to the devil. Um, you know, they're expecting some tattoos that are going to be required to buy and sell things, you know? Oh, one of the things that I heard growing up was that the mark of the beast was actually credit cards. (laughs) because <laughs> remember i grew up seventh day adventist yeah. so i heard some crazy oh, stuff I'm, I'm sure you did in that in that <laughs> denomination in particular they have some pretty wild beliefs. and um yeah but you know these are common in in a lot of christian denominations the things that we just mentioned there and what they are is a gross misunderstanding of the theology of the book of revelation um in fact, if they read the whole Bible in context, you'd see that the Antichrist appears in other places, not just Revelation. And when it is referred to in these other places, it's referred to in a plural. There's many Antichrists. And guess who they are? They're each and every one of us when we sin. Mm-hmm. That's an Antichrist. You want to know when the, who the Antichrist is? It's you when you fall short of the glory of God. That's an Antichrist. If you're worried about the end times, guess what? We've been in the end times since Jesus rose from the dead. That's the end times. Not some magic point at the po- in the future. It's now. You've been in it. We've been in it. We might be in it for another 10,000 years. We don't know. The parousia is a process. The coming of Christ is a process. So, you know, these uh, the, these concepts of this This mythos that surrounds this period of time is just a very broad misunderstanding of the book of Revelation. The Antichrist is not one single person, all right? It's not somebody that's coming. It's not a prophecy of something that's to come. Uh, It's anyone who's against Christ. Yeah, Antichrists. I think it's in Peter. I think it's in the epistles of Peter that it's talked about um, in that sense. Um. But yeah, that's a misconception. So you don't have to worry about who the Antichrist is. Just don't be him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're good. You're good to go. Um, and you don't have to even worry about when Jesus is coming back 
because as long as you've kept yourself your soul prepared for any moment that it could happen, I can guarantee you when you die, it's going to be the same thing anyway. So, you know, and we're all going to die. So rather than right. worry about some undetermined point in the future, which even Jesus wasn't concerned about, and it was such in, unimportant information that the father didn't even relay that information to Jesus. Jesus yeah. himself didn't even know because that's how He's unimportant like, I don't was. even know. Yeah. And that's one of the that was one of the funny things, because here I was growing up Seventh-day Adventist and they were all like, the world's going to end in the year 2000. Well, <laughs> obviously that didn't happen, but no. I kept hearing this and I was like, wait a minute, doesn't Jesus not even know? How are you? How do, <laughs> how do you, you know? know? <laughs> how do you know more than Jesus? Exactly. It's just, a, it's, it's, it's just, unfortunately, that's what happens. You know, theology gets uh, distorted and, and now that everybody and their mother you know, is a theologian, um, whether you have the degree or not, um, you know, people run with it. So, you know, there's, you got evangelical Christianity, which you know, there's no secret. I'm pretty critical of, um, and it's not to be bad mouth any one person. It's just an ideology I think is just dangerous to the Christian faith, um, for reasons like this, because they teach, you don't need the magisterium. You don't need the traditions of the church. You don't need what the fathers taught or passed on or handed down for posterity. You just pick up your English translated Bible, which probably if you're using the King James, which most of them do, is translated from some of the worst manuscripts that were available at the time. Yeah, there's um, much better manuscripts available now because, of course, we've made a lot of discoveries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, so you're much better off with a modern translation. One of the best ones, I think, is the New American Standard. I, I mean, that's a um, really good one. It really yeah. is. Um, because it, I it also like some, the NRSV. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, there's you want to use one that has access to the oldest manuscripts and talking about the Antichrist. You know, I, I mentioned this on um, on Stupid Morning Bullshit when I was interviewed on on um, that show on um, Adult Swim uh, for Halloween. And they asked me about 666 and, you know, talking about early manuscripts. Again, we only know 666 as the mark of the beast because the, old, the, the, the manuscripts we had available at the time that all of these English Bibles were translated um, were newer, and 666 was in there. But the oldest documents, the number 616... And a scribe made an error and became a prolific error, and then it got translated into all of the English Bibles over time. A lot of people don't know that. The actual mark of the beast is 616. All of the oldest documents have that. But, you know, this is what happens. So you have to be, you have to be very cognizant of what you're doing. You cannot read the Bible outside of context. You cannot read the Bible outside of its historical position. Because if you do that, if you try to say, oh, I'm going to read the Bible, I don't have any education, but I don't need it because the Holy Spirit's going to guide me. If you do that, you're good going luck. to, yeah, good luck. Because what you're going to do is you're going to create whatever you want to believe, which isn't going to have any remote connection to the truth. And that's just the way it is. Well, that's the end of the show, folks. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Joy for your brilliant and wonderful contributions. I really appreciate you, and I know our entire, our, our entire audience does as well. The, um, we'll be back next week, actually, um, with a, a very heated debate about Riki. Um, we have somebody from Twitter that was not happy with my criticisms of Riki, and she uh, reports herself to be, I think, a Riki master. Um, and so she wants I invited her on the show. I said, you know what? You think I'm wrong? That's fine. Come on. We'll talk about it. I'm always open to hear what people have to say, as long as they're willing to listen to me. I'm a little bit more knowledgeable about the subject than she thinks I am, but we'll, we'll have a good discussion at the very least, a respectful one, if not heated debate. Um, and that's coming up next uh, Friday uh, at uh, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. Pacific. We'll see you all then. Good night and God bless.